Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. David, how are you feeling after this episode? Absolutely stoked for the future of Ethereum, as I usually am. Ryan, when we started this podcast, the first 10 or so episodes was really about getting people onboarded into the bankless world, into the world of of crypto monies and, you know, protocols as financial institutions. And then DeFi blew up really hard, really fast. And we had to, uh, you know, we had to, we had to answer for that. There was a lot of excitement going on, but we never got to the topic of values as they are baked into the systems that we are using at specifically at the base layer of Ethereum itself, right? And this is what that episode was for. This episode is about learning about the design choices of the Ethereum protocol and how different values have been baked into how we have chosen to build Ethereum and how we have chosen to build Ethereum into the future. Yeah, if you're looking to understand what Ethereum is and what its future roadmap is, this is the episode for you. I I hope this becomes kind of a canonical episode for anyone who wants to learn about uh, Ethereum. And who better to explain it than Vitalik? Um, He has fantastic explanations. Sometimes they go into some technical detail, but hang with that and you'll get a perfect picture as to what the value system is for Ethereum and how it's going to shape up in the coming years. You know, one thing I was struck by, David, is um, we call it ETH 2.0, this whole new initiative, the, like the next, I guess, phase, the phases of the Ethereum roadmap. But there's really no Ethereum 2.0. It's all one Ethereum network. It's all one Ethereum value system and social contract. And mm-hmm. the thing that we call ETH 1 and ETH 2 will eventually merge anyway. And I saw that very clearly as we talked to Vitalik, that that was, that was going to happen. There's one Ethereum, there's one community, there's one uh, set of value systems that we all kind of abide by. And uh, it's just really exciting to see that level of unity. Yeah, I really like that framing. There's one collective of the Ethereum hive mind, right? And the blockchain is just one component of that. You know, the, uh, the off-chain component are, you know, people like you and me, uh, people like the listeners of this podcast, people that discuss and communicate values around sort of as this like super layer upon what we all perceive Ethereum to be, which, you know, right now is Ethereum 1.x and then also is about to be phase zero of Ethereum, which, you know, as you alluded to, we'll, we'll start off as a test net and then slowly kind of roll into actually being real life Ethereum. Uh, so that's a, that's a good point. There isn't one canonical version of Ethereum. There's just the values that we have and the code that we use to express it. You know, David, I'm really proud of something too. At one point we asked the question of Vitalik, like, hey, who decides what our values are as Ethereum? Like we keep using this term, our values, but how do we know what our values even are? And, you know, I'm really excited that the bankless nation has been part of that structuring of of, of value systems, right? I think the bankless nation, our value systems Mm -hmm. are are very clear. We want self-sovereign money. We want to remove intermediaries. We want to remove the bankers that control your life. And we are part of the value system. We determine partially the, the values of a system like Ethereum. It's just one big social contract uh, and one conversation. And Bankless absolutely plays a role there. So thank you, listeners, for keeping these values close to your heart, communicating them, spreading the word, spreading the message that what we want and what we need is a decentralized money system for the people by the people. This is our longest podcast yet. It goes on for almost two hours. And that's because we really take our time going through every single facet of Ethereum. Proof of stake, sharding, EIP 1559, rollups, the transition. And then we also do a fun uh, rollups round at the end where we ask some Vitalik we ask Vitalik some some quick questions. So use this episode as a tool to reference. It's long because it is dense. There should be something in here for everyone. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. All right, David, before we jump into the episode, let's talk for a minute about our fantastic sponsors. One of the tools I've started to use recently is Zapper. For those of you that were part of the 2017 bull market, it was characterized by just opening up Blockfolio and refreshing it over and over and over again. And also, anytime you ever made a trade, you would have to go into Blockfolio and manually input that trade information to make sure that your portfolio that you think that you have matches what you actually have. With Zapper, you don't have to do any of that anymore because all you have to do with Zapper is input your Ethereum addresses 
and then Zapper will give you a really elegant report as to where all your money is. So there will never ever be any disconnect between the money that you think that you have and the money that Zapper reports to you. Zapper looks directly on chain and gives you a nice portfolio summary of all your assets and how many assets and your, all of your debt and all of your lending positions, all of your positions all at once. So there's no more editing your portfolio because Zapper just does it for you. One thing that I thought was really useful about Zappers was when I plugged my wallets in, I found that I had submitted liquidity to Uniswap forever ago, and without Zapper, I would have probably lost that forever because Zapper knows where your money is better than you do. It's also the gateway to investing your money into this ever-expanding list of available DeFi platforms like Curve, Balancer, Uniswap, Yearn. In the Bankless Nation, there is this growing number of money Legos and keeping track of them all is just super overwhelming, which is why you could just go to Zapper and Zapper will, will solve the problem of there just being too many money Legos to choose from. So check them out at zapper.fi, enter your Ethereum addresses and check out your portfolio and see if there's anything that you missed. Bankless Nation, do you want to go fully bankless, but in the real world? Monolith is the DeFi account that you need. It wraps your ETH address in a bankless Visa card and it does so much more. It closes the loop from fiat to DeFi. So you can onboard fiat to DAI on Monolith with zero fees. Then you can convert that DAI to ADAI, which is an interest bearing savings account. Again, zero fees. And then you can spend that interest in the real world on a Visa card. So you can finally buy your cup of coffee with interest earned in DeFi. Guys, this is magic. This is the closest thing to the Holy Grail crypto card and Monolith gives you all of it. You need to download the app at monolith.xyz to get your bankless Visa card. It's optimized for European listeners. They'll be coming to the US soon. And when you get that Visa card, the Monolith card, tweet about it when you do. I love seeing people unpackaging their beautiful bankless Visa cards. It makes me realize that the revolution is here. Search Monolith in the App Store. Okay, let's get to the episode with Vitalik. Bankless Nation, we want to welcome back Vitalik Buterin, who is the founder of Ethereum, a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. Of course, he needs no introduction to the Bankless Nation. He's been here before. I'm sure you know of his work. Uh, we brought him here to talk about the why of ETH2, though. We want to dig deep into the design decisions that were made and also the values that were embedded in Ethereum 2.0. It is coming up fast and why we care about these values. Um, Vitalik, it's great to have you. Welcome to Bankless. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's good to be here again. All right. Well, I'm going to start with this. Skeptics have been saying ETH2 will never ship for a very long time, about as long as I've been in this space. Before that, they were probably saying ETH1 wouldn't ship. Um, I think they're wrong, but my question is a little bit different. Is Ethereum 2 going to ship as advertised? I think so. Um, I, mean, I think uh, ETH2, uh, is, and so first of all, uh, phase zero is uh, in test that has been in tested for a while, is uh, very close to being released. And phase zero offers everything that phase zero was always uh, stated that it would uh, provide. And it's got the proof of stake, it's a chain, it's uh, running, you can use it. Um, and then Phase one uh, provides uh, sharding, and sharding is uh, going to be there um, as uh, advertised. And then uh, scalability from uh, applications, and you just uh, I mean, combine together the sharding with uh, rollups, and I know I've got 100,000 TPS, which is, I think, uh, almost exactly the same as uh, among the crazier of the numbers that I've uh, uh, thrown around during the good old days around 2015 and 2016. Uh, so uh, both an uh, end to uh, mining and an introduction to a stake-based consensus uh, and ultra high scalability are both going to be within uh, the hands of Ethereum users, I think much sooner than a lot of people think. So we want to uh, zoom out and have this be sort of a canonical, like what is ETH2 episode and why? So wanna wanna zoom out and talk about this question. What political values is Ethereum going for in ETH2? And how did that really constrain the design space for ETH2 architecture? There's uh, two ways to look at what ETH2 is trying to accomplish. Um, one is to look at what it's trying to add uh, that ETH1 doesn't have and why. Um, and uh, number two is what is uh, ETH2 unwilling to give up in order to achieve that, right? Uh, so 
uh, from the uh, first uh, point of view, uh, so what is ETH2 trying to uh, achieve that uh, ETH1 does not have? Uh, I, the two major parts to this are one is a proof of stake and the other is uh, sharding. Uh, and I mean, proof of stake uh, is a, a fairly uh, kind of philosophically complex thing that uh, does uh, combine together multiple objectives. Uh, one of the really important ones, I think, is uh, just moving away from the uh, of extreme levels of uh, waste and um, energy and inefficiency that uh, you can find in proof of work systems. I'm also trying to move away from some of the uh, centralization risks uh, that we've been seeing in, uh, e in both uh, Ethereum and uh, even more so in Bitcoin with its uh, kind of much more mature ASIC ecosystem. Uh, and also a uh, proof of stake tries to be kind of maximally uh, democratic and open to uh, participate and not just as a user, but also as a, a staker, right? Um, sharding is a scalability solution. Uh, and so the goal is to try to just increase the number of transactions uh, that the Ethereum blockchain can handle from the status quo, which is about 15, if uh, we're talking about actual transactions that are on average that people send, or 45, if we just assume everyone only cares about sending uh, ETH transfers up to uh, some number between 1,000 and 100,000, depending on which phase you're talking about and uh, what kind of application it is. And increasing scalability is valuable because we believe in Ethereum as being this uh, kind of publicly accessible, open, uh, global architecture that people should be able to interact with uh, without um, kind of doing so through centralized intermediaries, right? Like we, we believe that kind of the base layers of the new internet should be a kind of open thing that uh, is expected for regular people to uh, be able to participate in. Uh, and if you don't do a scalability, then the alternative is to basically take some approach where, you know, you have some master network that only uh, uh, fairly powerful institutional actors participate in. And then uh, you start uh, having trusted uh, kind of side chains and most people would live in trusted side chains. And that's not really the kind of uh, world that uh, I, I want to be building. I um, mean, just to uh, basically, because I think uh, if intermediation becomes the norm, there's uh, a lot of uh, just historical examples of how inter uh, kind of institutionalized intermediation can very easily be uh, kind of seized and uh, turn into you know, a tool of control by uh, people that uh, the original creators of those systems were absolutely not expecting. And so that's why uh, kind of increasing TPS is valuable. Um, and then... The, uh, the uh, next question is uh, kind of what what properties are we not willing to sacrifice? Uh, so one of the properties that we really care about in ETH2, and I think perhaps the level of insistence on this maybe makes Ethereum stand out alone relative to uh, some of the other chains, um, is this principle that you know we do not want to have super node dependence, right? Like we want Ethereum to be a system that can run and up fully operate without relying on some kind of super powerful computer. Like we want the, the system to, if need be, be able to operate entirely just as a collection of consumer laptops. Uh, and this is uh, something that at least I personally strive to stick to uh, very closely. Um, I, because like, I do, I, I do believe in uh, kind of a lot of the Bitcoiner ideas um, around uh, big things um, like uh, you know if you let the chain just be kind of controlled by a small number of institutions, then you know you're creating a, a small number of actors that could uh, potentially take it over and start kind of pulling it in unfavorable directions. Um, I uh, want to uh, even encourage a kind of culture of uh, active participation in uh, kind of proof of stake uh, by regular users, for example. Uh, and that's uh, something that if you take uh, one of the these uh, paths that just say, oh, let's rely on super nodes that you just can't do. Right? Like if you have a chain that relies on uh, super nodes, as uh, a lot of these other blockchains are doing, so where you uh, just uh, rely on every node in the network to have a very powerful computer, then you're going to have a relatively small number of participants. And 
if uh, a large portion of those participants come together and say, you know, from uh, ne start next month, uh, start, uh, starting from then, we are going to just start enforcing different rules. And if you don't like it, screw you. There is a kind of much less of an, uh, a sort of institutional barrier against them doing that sort of thing because there's a much smaller number of participants uh, that would need to uh, collude. And there's a much smaller number of people whose nodes would just kind of break by default if that happens. Um, so decentralization is uh, in a kind of very significant part about avoiding those kinds of situations. Uh, so that's why we've been uncomfortable with super node assumptions, also uncomfortable with uh, honest majority assumptions. Um, this is one of those uh, things that I think uh, kind of unites uh, some Ethereum philosophy and uh, a lot of Bitcoin philosophy, right? Like Bitcoin philosophy is all about, you know, you validate the, the chain yourself. Um, because otherwise you're just trusting the minor majority and the minor majority is not necessarily that friendly. And ETH2 is also increasingly designed to offer strong and uh, robustness and security guarantees even in the face of a yeah, dishonest majority. Right? So I guess to kind of wrap up and uh, summarize uh, things again, I would say uh, number one, uh, just energy efficiency, uh, not being an environmental catastrophe, um, um, and all of those nice things. Uh, number two, making it possible for regular people to directly participate in the blockchain um, as a writer to the blockchain, uh, by which I mean a transaction sender. Uh, number three, making it possible for regular people to participate in the blockchain as a reader of the blockchain, as uh, so a direct reading of the blockchain uh, without relying on uh, any kind of, uh, of trusted APIs. And number four, making it possible for regular people to participate in the blockchain as a uh, kind of participant in a consensus. And if you take two, three, and four put together, then you can get a, a very high level of, uh, of um, censorship resistance, uh, kind of um, robustness, uh, resistance to social and political attacks, even at a very large scale. So, so you mentioned, you know, like I, I guess a couple words I would use to summarize some of that is permissionless, uh, mm -hmm. decentralized, you know, non-neutral. Those are important values, kind of embedded in the design. What what type of um, like constraints, I guess, did you have? Like, it, it's trickier to mm -hmm. design a system that embodies those values, and it's easier to take shortcuts. And I guess some of the question that that some of the ETH killers and other alternative. Uh, layer one chains are sort of asking is, well, do people really care about these things, Vitalik? Is it is it fine just to have, you know, maybe a little bit of decentralization? Like, why did Ethereum choose to be at one of one end of the spectrum in the way that it did? Right. I, I think trying to take a you know, more centralized path is uh, the sort of thing that works well in the short term, uh, but it ends up uh, really biting you in the long term. Um, so, like, you know, we have seen real live examples of uh, kind of centralization vectors of chains being used to do things that are you know, very uh, kind of disapproved of by their users, right? And I think uh, a lot of the most egregious examples we can see in the context of, uh, kind of some of the DPOS chains. Uh, so one example of this being how Steam uh, got uh, taken over by uh, Justin Sun, um, and who then proceeded to kind of establish and cement control over the delegates. Um, and when those uh, users uh, st uh, started to rebel, uh, the um, um, Justin and uh, you know, the people he was uh, colluding with uh, just ended up uh, kind of doing a lot of just increasingly authoritarian things on that chain until eventually the users uh, ended up having to fork away. And, and uh, in the context of uh, EOS, for example, we've seen a lot of uh, kind of bribing attacks uh, between uh, different delegates. Uh, so I think uh, like core participants of a blockchain ecosystem becoming unfriendly and colluding against their uh, users' interests uh, is something that is not just theoretical. It's uh, something of which uh, we have seen uh, very real examples. And... Like there's very real things that uh, kind of people potentially might want to do, right? Like people might want to uh, push through uh, some unpopular kind of hard fork where they uh, just give themselves coins, for example, right? Like that, like kind of political uh, kind of arguments and uh, manipulation around things like developer funds is something that we have seen. Um, so, 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, absolutely. Like even just from the evidence uh, that we can see here today, there is uh, just a lot of signs that show that uh, creating a blockchain where all you're doing is just creating a kind of voting scheme between, like, you know, somewhere between 10 and 50 fairly large actors actually in the long run is uh, potentially a pretty dangerous thing. So you do think in a nutshell that that users in the long run will very much value these characteristics mm -hmm. of permissionlessness, decentralization and neutrality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, these uh, the importance of these characteristics uh, I think uh, does the, sometimes takes time to reveal itself uh, because like there's this phenomenon uh, that when a uh, kind of community is harmonious and when times are good and if all governance uh, mechanisms say uh, tends to give the same result and it's a good one um, right so you know regardless of whether you have a market or a democracy or a dictatorship or whatever else when uh, kind of times are happy and people are roughly on the same page uh, then um, you know, just all of these mechanisms are just going to lead to and if the same thing because uh, yeah, everyone knows what everyone is going for, and um, you know, you know, there just is one result, so no matter what path you take, and it's and it's a fairly happy one. But it's uh, when there are disagreements and uh, disputes that uh, you start to see a lot of these uh, differences emerge, right? And uh, when there are disagreements and uh, disputes, uh, which is something that is going to happen to every chain eventually, then uh, the, the differences between uh, you know, truly decentralized systems uh, like, uh, you know, like Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, things um, like these uh, kind of much more centralized chains uh, just is going to reveal itself very strongly and a lot of people are going to potentially get nasty surprises. Are you seeing any other chains that embrace these values besides like a Bitcoin or an Ethereum? Uh, there are some. Um, so like one example of this, uh, I think like Coda or, and it renamed itself, I think, because of some stupid trademark thing. Um, so they are trying to create a blockchain that's... Uh, you know, just fully a, a ZK provable. Uh, so the idea would be that instead of having having to personally verify the chain, you would be able to just use one ZK snark to kind of fully verify the validity of the thing. And I think that kind of approach is fully in line with those principles uh, because it basically means that no matter how uh, much activity is happening, there is no way to sneak an invalid chain through because, well, you can't generate a fake proof. Um, I mean, Mimble Wimble is another example of this. And I, there's a lot of, uh, kind of smaller chains in the uh, kind of Bitcoin course um, expanded universe, uh, so to speak, that uh, are trying to implement these values to various extents. Um, in, uh, and then in the case of Ethereum, I mean, I think uh, Ethereum Classic is um, also one chain that uh, kind of values these things, though they're taking a kind of even more purist uh, approach to them kind of not doing sharding, for example, seriously considering reducing block uh, numbers and so forth. So it definitely is a, a niche that some projects are going towards, though I think uh, the number of projects uh, that try to access that ni this niche um, that the market can sustain is uh, much smaller than the number of uh, kind of quote unquote feature projects uh, that uh, the market can support. Like basically, because if you make a feature project, there's lots of different features that you can go after. But if you uh, kind of embrace neutrality and you embrace user sovereignty and embrace freedom, then there's like a much more limited number of uh, ways in which that can happen. Um, so. I do expect that uh, the number of uh, you know, more decentralization focused chains is uh, go um, is going to be small, but I think uh, the chains that can take the path and they can stick to it are going to be very successful. Backing up, Vitalik, we ha we have these principles right that that we've just gone over. Like we need a, a blockchain to be adequately decentralized uh, for obvious reasons, or else there mm -hmm. any and any centralization is a vector for attack. We also need a blockchain to be scalable because if it can't be scalable, then then as you alluded to, that leaves room for you know a, a new form of centralization to come in. Right. Through, uh, you know, usually through some form of of intermediary. And you know, it, back in 2015, when Ethereum 1.0 was was rolled out, we had uh, we, the 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 social contract around Ethereum had picked out some long term solutions to you know changing Ethereum from what it was about to be in uh, to what it wanted to be in the long term, mainly proof of stake and sharding. And if it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think proof of stake and, and sharding were 
kind of more or less uh, chosen as uh, uh, strategies for improving Ethereum even before Ethereum 1.0 was rolled out. How, how did we have such uh, strong assurances that these were the right solutions at the time? Mm -hmm. and so I definitely think that uh, you know, a large portion of the community considered proof of stake and sharding to be part of the social contract from all the way back in uh, 2015 or potentially even earlier. Uh, the Dow fork might have been the moment that uh, have cemented those things because uh, a lot of the people that really seriously opposed uh, proof of stake and sharding um, ended up also really seriously opposing uh, the Dow fork. And so they ended up going to the uh, ETC side. Um, as for why we are sure, uh, I think uh, one thing that's important to note is that it took a while for us to be sure, right? Like if you go back to the very first uh, proof of stake related blog post uh, that I made, uh, this is the blog post that's uh, introducing Slasher, um, then um, and, and you read uh, what that blog post says, like, you know, you see a disclaimer right at the top. The purpose of this post is not to say that Ethereum will be using Slasher in place of Dagger as its main mining function. Rather, Slasher is a useful construct to have in our war chest in case of stake mining becomes substantially more popular or a compelling reason is provided to switch. Uh, Slasher may also benefit other currencies that wish to exist independently of Ethereum, thanks to Taco Time for inspiration and for Jack Walker for improvement suggestions. So... Now, if you go back to January 2014, we're absolutely not certain that proof of stake uh, does not have fundamental flaws in it, right? Um, and um, if you look at the posts uh, that we had in uh, uh, trying to figure out sharding, like sharding was uh, described as an unsolved problem. And it was described in a list of unsolved problems, along with other problems that uh, we recognize today are you know, either unsolvable or unsolvable without very fundamental trade-offs. Um, so the post I'm thinking about here was uh, one from 2014 uh, that was called something like hard problems in uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, so this was early 2014. Then all the way throughout 2014, uh, the big uh, kind of philosophical expedition that we went on is uh, trying to figure out basically whether or not proof of stake can get around the nothing at stake problem. Uh, and eventually, um, we uh, came to this conclusion that uh, I expressed in my blog post uh, called How I Learned to Love Weak Subjectivity. I basically said, you know, no, it's not possible with proof of stake to get exactly the same uh, properties as a proof of work, but it's possible to get something that's reasonably close. And here are some strong, strong arguments for why I think it's close enough. Right? And so uh, that was probably... Yeah, and of the first major step, and then the second major step was uh, around 2016 to 2017 when we kind of really wrapped our heads around how the kind of other major class of uh, consensus mechanisms and of academic, uh, um, you know, Lamport, uh, D, Dwork, Lynch, uh, Stockmeyer, PBFT style, uh, BF, BFT consensus algorithms worked um, and really kind of deeply understood, like basically how they actually um, work and uh, how um, they fit into a proof of stake security model in a proof of stake context. Uh, so I think after those two discoveries uh, together, uh, proof of stake was uh, kind of basically set. And uh, the question was just discussing the details. Uh, and on the sharding side, it was uh, largely a question of like what security models uh, we were comfortable with. Uh, so around 2015 or so is uh, when we started thinking about random sampling, which was uh, the first uh, major uh, kind of breakthrough toward making sharding work. And then in 2017, there was that major breakthrough of uh, data availability proofs that allows uh, sharded blockchains to be secure even in a, a dishonest majority um, so a, a context. So even in the, con in the context of a 51% attack, an attacker can't uh, force an invalid chain through. Uh, so... After those uh, discoveries, I think we were pretty set that you know, sharding is a yeah, reasonable strategy. And at that point, uh, and I think uh, people were uh, broadly comfortable with uh, both of those uh, ma major pieces and, and things kept proceeding from there. So if you could put yourself in your own shoes of your 2015 version, and mm -hmm. in July, July 2015, the Ethereum blockchain rolls out. If, mm -hmm. at, the, at that time, uh, how far away did you think that proof of stake was going to be? I think we, we were definitely expecting something like one to one and a half years, um, which is, of course, uh, proves to be wildly over-optimistic as uh, a lot of timing things uh, ended up uh, proving to be wildly over-optimistic uh, in all parts of uh, 
the, the crypto space, um, you know, whether it's uh, things in Ethereum or things in the Lightning Network or things in some of the quote Ethereum killer projects. Um, but I think uh, in 2015, we were definitely kind of confident that uh, we will arrive at a yeah, proof, uh, proof of stake system and be able to implement it. And also, also at that time, I do want to hang on proof of stake uh, for, for a little bit more. But also at that time, when the Ethereum blockchain was just rolling out, what was the sort of uh, consensus around the you know monetary policy of Ether or the issuance schedule? Or was this even like a big subject at the time? Uh, it was. Uh, and the conclusions that we had then are actually quite different from the conclusions that we have now. Uh, so if you go back and read the Ethereum white paper, um, there's uh, a proposed issuance schedule that basically says that there would be about 16 million ETH that gets issued every year and this issuance would continue forever. And the rationale for this was, uh, one, there is a belief uh, that you need ongoing issuance for security. Um, there was definitely no certainty that proof of stake could come in and offer security uh, at a much lower cost than proof of work. We were assuming proof of work forever. Um, and three, there was this fairness argument that said that, um, you know, we want uh, ETH to be accessible to uh, people who exist in the future and not just people who exist in the present. And so those were kind of the major arguments uh, that we had at the time. Uh, and since then, obviously, uh, both the Ethereum community and I think a lot of us have uh, come around to this uh, kind of issuance minimalist uh, or minimum viable issuance, uh, I guess, as uh, the frame philosophy. And we've come around to proof of stake and we've come around to issuance reductions. And I think a couple of things happened there, right? So one of the things that happens there is just us becoming convinced that proof of stake was feasible and proof of stake was necessary. But another thing that happened was uh, the dream of uh, proof of work being an egalitarian distribution model uh, just like slowly uh, kind of suffocated and died over the last few years, I guess, right? Like in uh, 2010 to 2013, proof of work was this very democratic thing where uh, one of the selling features of Bitcoin is that, you know, you, yes, you can uh, go turn on your computer and you can get a few units and, uh, you know, compare with uh, how a fiat currency works, where to issue it, you need to be a kind of large, uh, you know, commercial or central bank. Here, anyone on their own computer can make some Bitcoin. And I think this was a major appeal of proof of work. It was a major appeal of Bitcoin. But the reality is that that was never a long-term technologically stable equilibrium because as soon as you have a large source of revenue, eventually people will specialize and people will optimize um, uh, their way to, uh, to get at it before everyone else does. Right? And in Bitcoin, we saw the uh, GPU revolution, then right after that, the FPGA revolution, then right after that, the ASIC revolution. And in the case of uh, Ethereum, uh, we uh, deliberately designed the proof of work algorithm to be ASIC resistant um, with uh, the goal of, uh, of preserving the egalitarianism of uh, Ethereum mining, basically. But then over time, um, you know, we saw both um, how even a GPU-based system uh, can uh, become more and more uh, resource and uh, money dependent over time. And also just growing risks uh, that ETH hash itself uh, would uh, get ASIC at some point. And so we just recognized that uh, kind of this dream of being a, um, egalitarian by uh, being a yeah, proof of work system was something that was uh, just not feasible um, regardless. It's a benefit that was no longer there. Um, and so without that, uh, that uh, benefit, then, you know, the question is, well, uh, do you issue ETH to um, a, a class of existing rich people, or do you issue uh, less ETH or try to not issue ETH at all? Um, and so the second started uh, looking more attractive. The assumption being made is that any proof of work system ultimately uh, moves towards ASICs, no matter what, right? And I, th I think yeah. this is pretty much a, a, a true assumption that any, any proof of work system, if there's value there, there is therefore the incentive to design such a computer that is harder and harder to be accessed by retail, right? And this is why Ethereum chose uh, GPU mining as a starting point, right? Because mm -hmm. GPUs you can buy in your, you know, in your local consumer hardware store. A lot of people already own them in their gaming computer. And as a function of decentralization, if you can validate the blockchain on GPUs, there are more possible people that can validate the blockchain. But the worry here was that, you know, and especially with Ether issuance, um, the worry was that, you know, people, specialists were going to come in and turn this into a business that would outcompete individuals, right? And if we are continuing to uh, issue Ether 
at a rate, which also the, the goal of issuing Ether was to also get Ether into the hands of many people, right? Through distribution, through issuance. But the concern was that the Ether being issued was just only going to go to the people that had specialized in mining. And w would you say that this is a, comp uh, a persistent critique of mining regardless of the blockchain or is this specific to Ethereum? I think it's a critique of mining regardless of the blockchain. Like I think uh, Bitcoin mining is basically plutocratic already. Uh, for Ethereum mining, realistically, it's only a matter of time. Um, and uh, were there not this uh, dangling threat of uh, moving to either Prague Power or some other algorithm or just uh, accelerating proof of stake, uh, then it may well have been ASIC uh, much more strongly already. And I think... Um, any algorithm that tries to be ASIC resistant, unfortunately, only has some shelf life within which that continues to be true. So at this time, this decision was being made. Uh, was it clear that proof of stake would actually enable the reduction of ETH issuance by being able to provide, you know, more or equal levels of security with less, uh, less issuance of Ether? And when we released the white paper as a part of the sale, uh, we definitely knew that proof of stake was something we were very interested in and was a possibility, but we were definitely not confident enough in the eventual possibility of a proof of stake to market it as a certainty, uh, which is a, a big part of why we made the decision to advertise ETH at the time as a, something that would have an issuance of a 16 million tokens a year forever. One of the really good things that I like about how Ethereum has rolled out is as a proof of stake system is that it started as a proof of work system, specifically started as a GPU mining system. Like GPU miners yeah. to this day are, are still viable. And as a system for distributing Ether, I think this has been really good. It's been a great way to like, you know, sprinkler around a bunch of Ether around the world to people that are running GPUs, right? It's good for Ether distribution, which is important for decentralization, especially in proof of stake, because the distribution of Ether is a centralization vector that we have to pay attention to. Um, but it seems that in proof of stake Ethereum, we have um, sacrificed this uh, wonderful feature of Ether distribution in the name of uh, you know, uh, securing proof of stake. It, would, it, would you like to see a way for, you know, a, a different way for further Ether distribution or are you relatively satisfied with how distributed it is today? I think uh, the challenge with uh, cryptocurrency distribution mechanisms is that coming up with uh, mechanisms that are credibly neutral is uh, hard. Um, right, like the thing with proof of work that's uh, nice is that it's an algorithm, uh, and so it's uh, credibly neutral because, um, well, people know what the algorithm is. Like anyone can verify uh, that someone made a valid solution. Um, Whereas uh, if you were to try uh, some other alternative, like for example, one thing that uh, Ripple did was they just had a bunch of giveaways through um, you know, social media channels and other kind of weak, weak identity channels. And the problem there is, well, eh, you know, do you know, is that actually, uh, did they actually do it honestly? Did they cheat in some way? Did some hacker who had 10,000 accounts cheat in some way? Um, were they being fair by using these platforms and forgetting about the Chinese platforms or about the Indian platforms? And, um, you know, if you try to uh, basically get to some kind of uh, poor person-based issuance, uh, you just start running into all of these quagmires so that you, know, you really don't want to see a base layer blockchain and necessarily getting involved in. And whereas the proof of work issuance is much more neutral, I mean, proof of stake issuance is much more neutral as well, though it's not really a uh, kind of distribution mechanism because proof of stake just uh, distributes to existing holders. So it's a good strategy for uh, paying holders to do things like helping secure the network, but you know, it's not going to make the, the uh, currency more widely distributed in any way. Uh, so the uh, the lack of a credibly neutral distribution mechanism other than uh, proof of work and proof of stake is uh, one of the uh, challenges um and then the other challenge is that any new components to the distribution is just bound to be uh, controversial and uh, potentially difficult to get accepted um right so uh, between those two challenges i think it definitely is difficult to add a new issuance components uh, but we'll see one critique I often hear of proof of stake is that it locks people in to a certain extent, right? Like if you are a staker, you know, at, at genesis of, of proof of stake, you can be a staker for the rest of time. In stark contrast, if you are a Bitcoin miner, you always have to be, you know, 
you know, keeping up to date with technology, keeping up, date, up to date with efficiency, always updating your system and improving over time. And if you don't do that, then you get wiped out by other miners who do do this, right? So stakers are locked in forever. And, and Bitcoiners don't really like that because it, it kind of it seems uh, similar to the, the Cantillon effect where, you know, maybe the stakers are closer to the issuance of new ether than the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the world. And so they have, you know, undue... Uh, access to the the issuance of new ether, uh, and you know, they, if you are a staker today, you can be a staker, you know, in fifty, a hundred, uh, maybe a thousand years. Uh, and so, like, there isn't really this churn of new sets of stakers that are able to come in without you know having to purchase a bunch of of ether. Uh, is, is this bad? Uh, so, I, mean, I do think that there is something to that critique. Like, I definitely don't think that proof of stake is you know, 100% better than uh, proof of work in every way. Like I think it's maybe, you know, 80 to 85 or 90% better. And this is one of those areas where you know, proof of work does have a uh, kind of genuine advantage in uh, terms of uh, reducing the possibility of long-term capture. Um, the things uh, that I would uh, say in response to that, though, is... Uh, so one, uh, the proof of work industry right now is fairly young. So of course, it's going to see disruptions uh, once every year or a couple of years. But uh, you know, there's no evidence uh, that a mature proof of work industry is going to continue having the same properties. Uh, in fact, one of the things that Bitcoin people talk about in the long run is this concept of a thermodynamic limit, that there is this cap of like basically a minimum cost of uh, generating uh, a uh, valid hash solution. And once uh, miners start getting close to this cap, then, well, you know, there, it's physically impossible to get uh, even more efficient than that, right? So, like, uh, what do you do? Right? So, like, even in the medium term, there's definitely a possibility that the uh, industry of generating this hardware is going to ossify more. Uh, so that's critique number one. Uh, critique number two is that... Now, even though proof of stake and being a staker is uh, kind of quote being closer to the uh, uh, the faucet of a new money, um, it's uh, also something that's open for any ETH holder to participate in. Uh, right. So if you have thirty two ETH, you can go and stake it. If you have less than thirty two ETH, you can go join some others and uh, start staking through a pool. Uh, whereas uh, in a proof of work context, like unless you have tens or hundreds of million dollars to start creating an ASIC farm, you know you can't uh, kind of get at this uh, tab yourself, right? So that's probably the second thing. Um, so uh, the, you know, is it that uh, kind of much of a wealth concentration risk if uh, anyone can uh, participate? Uh, number three uh, is that uh, rewards in proof of stake are much lower in an absolute sense, right? Like we're talking about you now maybe 15% if uh, only 1% of ETH holders are participating, but then if more people start participating, then it starts going down to uh, 5%, 3%, 2%. Uh, and so the rate at which uh, kind of wealth grows if uh, everyone starts staking is much smaller than uh, the uh, kinds of income that you could potentially get as a, a proof of work participant. And so I guess uh, to summarize, uh, there is definitely this uh, genuine advantage of uh, Proof of work having this kind of built-in churn property, but at the same time, uh, you know the fact that this churn is high today uh, is absolutely not evidence that it's uh, going to continue to be high tomorrow. Uh, number two is um, that uh, in proof of stake, just getting in and becoming part of this uh, set of validators yourself is much easier and uh, more accessible. I mean, number three, it just matters much less because the revenue of uh, being a staker is much much lower than the. Uh, revenue of uh, being a miner and then number four uh, a really important thing is like well you know if someone does end up uh, just like sitting there for a long time and eventually getting to more than 51 percent of uh, all the hash power all the stake like what can they do about it and proof of stake opens much more recourse for a community to recover from a 51 percent attack than proof of work does and this is i think another one of those important topics that's a advantage of proof of stake that i think a lot of people don't appreciate which is that in a proof of work system if 51 percent of the miners attack what can you do right you just let the attack happen like maybe uh, you kind of soft fork it out well, if you soft work it out, okay, fine. You know, the, chain, the attacker can just attack the chain again, 
right? And then you can attack the chain again and again. Um, I uh, call this uh, a spawn camp attack. Uh, that's the uh, terminology that I use, uh, kind of a reference to a spawn camp in you know, you know, like World of Warcraft and so forth. So you just uh, kind of just keep attacking the chain. You just keep making it dead. Um, and the only way to uh, recover from a, a spawn camp at attack is to change the proof of work algorithm, right? But then if you change the proof of work algorithm, one problem is that you're not just breaking the attacker's miners, you're also breaking um, all of the good guys' miners. Uh, so it's a more kind of expensive and higher collateral damage strategy. And the second problem is that you can only um, change the proof of work algorithm once, right? Because if you change it once, then... Uh, Nobody's going to have an ASIC for the new algorithm. And then if the attacker manages to also corner the market on CPUs or GPUs, then they can spawn camp a second time, and the second time you can't break out at all. right? So in proof of work, recovery from uh, persistent 51% attacks is actually kind of bleak. In a proof of stake context, it's uh, a very different story because... If there's a 51% attack on a proof of stake system, what you can do is you can have a fork, and in uh, this fork, uh, a kind of minority coordinated uh, user activated soft fork that basically uh, consists of the victims of the 51% attack getting together and continuing the original chain and ignoring the attacker's blocks. Uh, in that fork, you can just basically delete the attacker's coins. And you don't even need to have a hard, uh, a explicit hard fork to delete the attacker's coins. Like actually, the Ethereum protocol just like does this by default because of how the inactivity leak works, right? Like in a minority fork, whoever the majority is just loses half of their ETH to, to uh, inactivity leaks uh, before finality happens. And so every time there's a fifty-one percent attack, even if it succeeds, uh, uh, the attacker loses a lot of money. Uh, and if they want a fifty-one percent attack a second time, they have to lose a lot of money again and so the uh, economics are just incredibly unfavorable to an attacker in a way they just aren't uh, in a proof of work context uh, so that's probably the fourth uh, and kind of more underestimated rebuttal which is that like, if someone does get to 51 percent attack well you know, so what? Like, if they uh, end up doing anything bad with their powers, they just always run the risk of the community getting angry and uh, just like forking them out and ends up burning half their money. It feels like a, an example of some hidden social recovery that actually exists in a proof of stake system like Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And and I think what you're saying is like something like Bitcoin is it's it's harder to recover, you know, socially mm -hmm. from an attack like that. Um, I'm kind of struck by some of the the uh, language we've used, we've all used so far, right? When when we talk about, you know, some of the things have changed. You were talking about issuance early, earlier, where you thought originally, you know, um, and people in Ethereum thought originally that we would have some sort of perpetual issuance to ETH, and then we said, you know, we we decided, or uh, we've used terms like like our values um, to to make changes to minimum viable viable issuance and things like that. I guess my question is this: How do we even know? what our values are? Good question. I mean, I think uh, the biggest way that we can uh, be sure about what our values are is just by talking about them. Uh, so this is something that I think, uh, you know, we're doing right now in this podcast. It's something that I do in my um, writings and uh, blog posts. It's something that a lot of other uh, of Ethereum developers do in their you know, writings and uh, posts and uh, their uh, presentations. And you know, just understanding uh, kind of what uh, we're trying uh, we uh, kind of care about and what's uh, important to us and we're trying to accomplish I think is uh, just an important step in uh, uh, kind of getting everyone onto the, uh, uh, on the same page um, and then uh, and then I think uh, beyond that like once uh, there's uh, some uh, kind of level of uh, basic uh, basic agreements on the priorities or when you know there's priorities that some people feel a lot really strongly about other people care less about well you know usually we can still uh, kind of do some thinking and do some research and engineering and uh, come up with a design that uh, ends up getting uh, kind of the properties that uh, everyone is going is going after at the same time which i think is something that ethereum 2.0 for example has managed to accomplish on at least several occasions it also appears to be the case that when we kind of state our values as an Ethereum community, and even as the bankless community, this is this is kind of similar, um, we start to draw other people in who also embrace those values. So it seems to be sort of a, a magnet. And then what we end up doing is we start embedding those values into, into code, and then people who subscribe to that value set can then opt in. Is that kind of how it works? Absolutely. I think uh, no, the... Uh, 
applications that you use are definitely another important way of uh, expressing your values and uh, kind of helping your values succeed uh, within the Bankless Nation, right? I had one example of this is uh, Uniswap, right? So Uniswap is definitely itself a very values-driven project. It started as a uh, project um, that was just trying to build a maximally simple, uh, easy to use decentralized exchange at a time when all of the other projects were going for complexity, they were going for uh, certain kinds of theoretical cleanness, or they were going for, you know, for uh, just centralization. And Uniswap, uh, in some ways, uh, just kind of said screw you to a lot of things that uh, people thought were fundamental to an exchange, like even the concept of an order book. And, uh, you know, they were criticized uh, for this, uh, but uh, they just kind of pulled through. Uh, and uh, published uh, this uh, thing that was just a contract. Anyone can go interact with a contract, no dependence on servers, uh, you know, very uh, kind of purist about it. Uh, it. It's just a web page that uh, talks to a contract. People can go use it. And uh, over time, more and more people did use it. And uh, in 2020, Uniswap uh, has uh, taken over even many major centralized exchanges in volume, and it's uh, become a mainstay of the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so... I think even uh, just things like that also uh, help to uh, express and cement uh, the kinds of things that uh, the Ethereum ecosystem considers to be important. This is also why I know, Vitalik, you've spoken on kind of chain maximalism in the past. And I, I agree with you know pretty much everything you've said on that subject. But there's also something I think that's pernicious, with, uh, pernicious in, in kind of the, the broader crypto community, which is like chain relativism, right? So not all chains and not all projects, even on Ethereum, embrace the same value sets and we kind of like like we kind of have to choose by using an application or using a chain what our values actually are do you think that there there is a risk of chain relativism where everyone's like yeah every chain is the same tron is the same as ethereum and they all are like public blockchains and that sort of thing um is that a risk we run should we make our values a bit more explicit what's your take on that Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there definitely is a, a risk from uh, chains uh, that just care less about values uh, to try to uh, kind of market the idea that the, those values are not really that important. Um, and I mean, to some extent, you could argue that that's kind of symmetric to things that Ethereum is uh, doing relative to the Bitcoin ecosystem, for example. So. Like, um, you know, Ethereum has proof of stake, Bitcoin has proof of fork, and Ethereum people do argue that, uh, you know, the kind of, quote, objectivity uh, that uh, proof of work provides is actually not that much better than the, you know, quote, weak subjectivity that proof of stake provides. And this is one of those uh, kind of big uh, academic uh, uh, debates where, and I think from the Bitcoin point of view, it definitely gets, uh, I I'm sure, interpreted as uh, kind of trying to dilute the concept of uh, decentralization into nothingness. But... Ultimately, like whether or not uh, an instance of uh, that is uh, kind of reasonable or not reasonable, uh, you can't figure it out from the abstract. You have to like actually uh, dig into the technical arguments and kind of actually understand what's going on, right? And I think uh, within a technical audience, uh, I think people understand uh, you know, what Bitcoin is going for and uh, what Ethereum is going for, and uh, they understand uh, that things uh, that... Uh, Tron is uh, tr uh, trying to do, for example, are just you know fundamentally not interesting. Like, okay, it has more scalability because it's more centralized. That kind of whoop you do and whatever, right? And so there are um, uh, kind of less technical people that still get drawn in, which is, uh, I think, uh, definitely a big concern. Um, and I definitely do think uh, that the Ethereum ecosystem can be uh, just uh, kind of more forceful and more clear about you know what are the important properties that make uh, Ethereum applications be Ethereum applications. Um, though at the same time, like I, I do feel like uh, within at least uh, out of the more technically inclined portion uh, portion of the community, that me uh, that message is uh, already getting through to a large extent. Uh, I mean, th there's definitely uh, also the kind of entire spectrum of uh, projects uh, that are kind of more centralized than Ethereum, but are not uh, kind of outright scammy in the way that Tron is. Um, and, you know, you have all of the various chains that are making a, a serious effort at uh, doing, you know, 5,000 uh, on-chain TPS uh, without sharding. 
at the cost of uh, decentralized verifiability. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in addition to the debate that's happening within the Ethereum ecosystem, there's definitely a, a, a kind of crypto ecosystem wide uh, debate that's um, happening um, both on the level of people arguing and uh, on the level of just real life events happening uh, that uh, is uh, kind of about you know, to what uh, to what extent are uh, kind of di different values uh, important to uh, making a uh, blockchain project successful in the long term? And, and I don't think there's any way around this other than just to recognize that you know, the Ethereum ecosystem um, is a participant uh, in the debate, and uh, you know we have uh, kind of some uh, some particular positions, and uh, we think that those positions are kind of the correct ones and we should both uh, kind of be vigilant and uh, make sure that we have the correct positions and if we do, and if we don't sort of be even be open to changing our minds on certain issues which i think we have on uh, um a couple of, of uh, occasions but you know where we are correct uh, just like, make sure that we can uh, and if explain to the broader ecosystem and the uh, world why we've uh, made the trade-offs that we have your Ethereum address is a bankless bank account, but here's the problem. It doesn't have a human readable name. It's represented by this long hexadecimal string that no one can read. Unstoppable Domains has the solution to that problem. It provides a domain name for your Ethereum address. So instead of telling someone to send you funds to 0xE3BA blah blah blah, you can tell them to send funds to yourname.crypto, a domain name for your Ethereum address. At unstoppabledomains.com, you can search for blockchain domains like this and find tools to easily launch websites on decentralized web technology like IPFS. You can even have Unstoppable Domains help you manage your .crypto or .eth or even .zil domain name addresses at their Unstoppable Domains manager. Websites have domain names, .com, .org, your bankless bank account on Ethereum should have a domain name too. So go to unstoppabledomains.com, register a domain name for your Ethereum address now, unstoppabledomains.com. Lyern is DeFi's first self-building project on Ethereum, focused on producing products for those who are interested in earning yield in DeFi. Wyern's various products are all built to suit each individual investor's preferred level of risk, from various vault strategies that leverage DeFi tokens to the safer earn system which relies on stable coins. Vaults are aggressive yield farming robots, each with a unique strategy that is designed to maximize the yield of the deposited asset. Wyern employs some of the most informed developers in DeFi to keep the vault strategies updated with the various yield farming opportunities on Ethereum. For customers who are more risk adverse, the Wyern's Earn product may be for you. Earn is a yield aware dynamic money market that automatically seeks the best interest rates across the various DeFi protocols and regularly migrates your deposited stable coins between the DeFi protocols that are returning the best yield at the present moment. Wyern is a system that is just a little over four months old, so things are still very much an experiment. However, this hasn't stopped people from depositing over $700 million worth of assets into the Wyern system in order to find yield on Ethereum. Perhaps the people that deposited all this money were tired of constantly making daily transactions to follow the best DeFi interest rates, and maybe the gas fees that they were paying ended up eating too much into their profits. With Wyern, it doesn't remove the risk of these various protocols that it leverages, but it does remove the overhead of constantly trying to make sure you're finding the best yield, and also so that you don't have to pay for gas to switch up your assets. Check out the products that Wyern has to offer at yearn.finance. That's Y-E-A-R-N.finance. I want to go back and wrap up the proof of stake conversation because staking is one of the ways to best signal alignment with values that we're discussing, right? Like if somebody is, uh, if their values are aligned with Ethereum, they're likely to be a staker, right? And part of Ethereum requires people to be staking and people to be staking in their homes more or less. So Vitalik, why should people stake? Why, why should someone feel the responsibility or uh, to express their their values by staking Ether on proof of stake Ethereum. Yeah, and I view uh, staking as being a kind of a sort of declaration that you're a type of uh, citizen of the Ethereum network. I guess you know it's definitely not the only type of uh, of being a citizen of uh, of the Ethereum network, um, and there's lots of ways to participate. Uh, if you have less than 32 ETH, well, even if you have less than two e uh, 32 ETH, you can still uh, stake uh, 
as part of a pool. Uh, but, but you know, there's definitely other things uh, that you can do. But you know, just running a node uh, and is, signals you know, long-term dedication to uh, the uh, uh, to the network and an interest in of helping to keep the network uh, maximally decentralized and secure uh, and. At the same time, it's a yeah, source of uh, ongoing revenue, and it's a kind of source of ongoing uh, um, incentive alignment with uh, the yeah, security of uh, the Ethereum blockchain and the uh, success of the ecosystem. So, for people that aren't staking, should they still be running a node, or is it more uh, relevant for you know some types of people to run a node versus others? Uh, so I definitely believe in the idea that even if you're not staking, um, you should be trying to validate the Ethereum blockchain as much as possible. Um, and I talk about why validation is important um, in, uh, in a couple of posts, uh, right? So if you go to uh, Vitalik.ca, uh, one of the more recent ones is uh, a philosophy of blockchain validation. Uh, one of the ones earlier... Uh, was um, engineering security through coordination uh, problems and then hard fork, soft forks, defaults, and coercion. And again, some of these posts I uh, talk about the uh, reasons why um, I think it is important to have a culture where as many users as possible um, actually run nodes that personally validate the chain in uh, various ways. And there's different levels of validation that you can have, right? So like in a sharding context, for example, you're not going to be literally checking every single thing yourself, but there's techniques like... Uh, you know, data availability validation, uh, for example, where you can probabilistically validate correctness. Um, you can validate the beacon chain shard. Um, you can be checking fraud proofs. You can run a stateless client. You can even run a light client, um, which is uh, better than, uh, you know, trusting subserver. Uh, and it, it definitely is, I think, healthier for the ecosystem the more people do those things. Uh, and it's healthier for the ecosystem the more we do to uh, make it easy for people to do those things. Like I, for example... I'm definitely unhappy with the fact that, you know, MetaMask, uh, for example, is just a uh, client that directly talks to Infura or whatever. I mean, I recognize uh, kind of the reality is that there isn't really much of a, of a better way right now, but this is uh, absolutely something that we should be trying to uh, kind of engineer our way past. And uh, there's a lot of good, great projects that are trying to engineer their way past it. I mean, even uh, ETH2, for example, is designed to have a much uh, simpler and uh, better light client than uh, ETH1 does. So we hope that things like MetaMask and things like Status uh, can uh, end up uh, adopting it over time. Vitalik, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about um, proof of stake and the origins of it. Um, can, can you talk about maybe the origins of, of sharding? It was theorized as the most likely candidate for Ethereum scaling, kind of narrowed down, it sounds like, as you evaluated uh, and ETH researchers evaluated other alternatives. But but how was this determination made? Like, like why sharding? Uh, research and thinking about sharding uh, definitely started uh, as um, early as uh, 2014. And I think the mindset there was just, it was fairly obvious right from the beginning uh, that everyone validating uh, every transaction is uh, the simplest and dumbest thing that you can do um, in uh, terms of uh, creating a blockchain that satisfies the security property that uh, uh, for a block to uh, get accepted, it needs to be valid, uh, valid and uh, available. Uh, and there was a natural desire to just like, well, see, well, hmm, you know, maybe if we can do some research um, and do some hard thinking, there is a you know, much more efficient and a better approach. And in general, I think uh, I was uh, kind of inspired by uh, the kind uh, of computer science um, that I had learned over the last couple of years. And one of the things that uh, my computer science kind of really instilled on me is that, like, in a lot of uh, computer and computing problems, there's a very simple um, uh, algorithm that can achieve a one level of efficiency. But then there usually is an algorithm that's only somewhat more complex that can achieve something close to a kind of per um, optimal efficiency, right? Like one example of this is if you look at just like sorting, right? Like if you have a list of numbers, um, can you rearrange them in a kind of lowest uh, greatest order? And uh, if you just ask someone who's never heard of sorting before to come up with a sorting algorithm, they generally come up with an algorithm that says something like, you know, walk through the list, take the lowest number, take it out, walk through the list again, take the lowest number, take it out, and keep going until the uh, list becomes empty. 
And uh, that kind of algorithm has a runtime of what's called O of n squared, right? So uh, whatever the length of the list is, square that number, and that's how long it takes to run. If you have a list of length 10, it'll take 100 steps. If you have a list of length 20, it'll take 400 steps. If you have a list of length 1,000, it'll take a million steps and so forth. But um, quadratics are kind of O of n squared sorting is not the most efficient way of sorting, right? And it turns out that there are these uh, kind of medium clever techniques. Uh, there's merge sort, uh, quick sort, a whole bunch of other sorts that instead of taking uh, n squared time, they take kind of n log n time, right? So n log n, like a simple kind of non-mathy way of thinking about it is like, n multiplied by the number of digits in n, right? So for example, if uh, the list has a length of 100, uh, then you know, it'll be like 100 times uh, 3 because the number 100 has three digits. And then if you have 1,000 items, um, it would take uh, 4,000 steps because 1,000 times the number of digits in 1,000 is 4. And in reality, it's not like decimal digits. It's binary digits. Uh, but, uh, so it'll be a couple of times longer than that. But you know, that's basically what you get to, right? And you can see um, how these algorithms, like, if you understand how they work, they still feel very kind of mathematically clean and uh, neat. Uh, they definitely are somewhat more complex than the naive ones, uh, but and they do take uh, kind of a lot of conceptual thinking to get to them. Uh, and so, the kind of vague hope that we had in 2014 is, well, if you imagine just naively validating every block as being the equivalent of um, insertion sort, right? The equivalent of one of these naive uh, sorting algorithms that take uh, n squared time, where you know, if you have a thousand item list, uh, it takes a million steps to run. Then you know what is the equivalent of like quick sort or merge sort? What is the equivalent of this uh, other algorithm that takes uh, a lot of brain power to figure out, only a medium amount of brain power to understand, but that gives uh, kind of much better results? Like what it, what is the equivalent of that, and uh, kind of can we search for it and get at it? Uh, and sharding quickly emerged as being. Uh, uh, one of the kind of ideal strategies or categories of strategies in this regard. And it was kind of obvious, right? Because, well, if you want to do something better than everyone validating everything, then you need everyone to only validate a few things. So then the question is, well, how do you make it be secure against uh, kind of what we call 1% attacks, where an attacker with a small amount of hash power tries to concentrate their hash power on uh, one particular subset of the chain and just cause that subset of the chain to break? And so we did a lot of thinking, and you know, eventually we actually did come up with a couple of uh, quite clever strategies to uh, get around those kinds of risks. And uh, basically, that's where the sharding came from. And basically, sharding is kind of like replicating the Ethereum main chain, right? In the ETH2 design, it's you know uh, currently like 64 kind of repl replicas, all sort of governed by a, uh, a beacon chain. Just to add a bit, the really important thing that makes sharding tick is the concept of... Uh, that you don't have everyone for validating every committee, that you right. have on average every node only um, and gets assigned to uh, validate a small portion of the uh, blocks and the transactions. Like either they get assigned to a shard or they get reassigned to a different shard every block, or they have to like, say validate one transaction from, uh, from each block and they get assigned to a random transaction index or something like that, right? So the key is to move away from everyone validates to uh, a smaller number of randomly selected actors validate, which is the well secret. Okay, why, why Vitalik? Do some people still think sharding is impossible? I hear that a lot still. Mm. I think there's a few different uh, kind of classes of uh, critics. Uh, so there's one class of critic, I think, that's just the the not very intellectual type that doesn't really understand the concepts of like indirect validation, probabilistic validation, all these things, and the, uh, it tends to have a very binary uh, sort of thinking, and they say, you know, either you're validating or you're not, and either you're personally validating everything or the thing is centralized. Which one are you? Um, and then there is the more kind of intellectual and nuanced critics that tend to is express skepticism about, well, you know, what are these added assumptions that these uh, sharding verification mechanisms are introducing, and... No, do they uh, potentially introduce uh, kind of a lot of brittleness in reality? Uh, so, I mean, I could give one example of where the like this kind of brittleness might actually exist. Um, so, if you look at um, fraud proofs, uh, for example, right? Uh, so, fraud proofs are this idea that um, you know instead of everyone validating everything, uh, then 
you would have a small number of actors uh, validate some computation and attest to the result of a computation. And the word attest here basically means that you would publish a digitally signed message um, that contains the results. And uh, this signed message can be verified by anyone as coming from them. And they have some ETH that's deposited in a smart contract on the Ethereum chain. And if they attest to something incorrect, then someone else can challenge them. And if there's a challenge, that execution actually happens on the Ethereum chain. And if it turns out that they actually are wrong, then their deposit gets taken away. Right. And so the um, idea is that, um, like, you know, how in a, a lot of legal context, uh, you would say things like, I swear under penalty of perjury that, you no, know, I believe blah, blah, blah is true. Right. And then, a like if you uh, make one of those uh, statements and you swear under penalty of perjury, but you swear under penalty of perjury to something that's totally false, you know some of the time you'll get away you'll get away with it, but some of the time uh, someone will uh, kind of catch you um, and they might potentially uh, kind, of, kind of like point to the fact that you know hey you actually said this. Um, and look, it turns out it's not true. And like, let's have a court case about this. And then that could end up like either hurting your interests like really seriously in some legal case, or potentially could be used to kind of ind uh, independently pu uh, punish you pretty seriously in some way and so forth, right? Um, and so the idea is basically that it's the, the same kind of principle um, that you replace direct uh, verification of everything with this more scalable approach of uh, kind of trust, but probabilistically verify, right? Um, and so, okay, so that's what fraud proofs do. The problem with fraud proofs, the problem with fraud proofs um, is basically the synchrony assumption, right? Is uh, basically the assumption that there exists an active network and if someone sends something and they claim that that thing is valid, that that thing actually will reach one of these uh, sentry nodes that's, uh, that's checking everything. And then if the sentry node discovers that it's wrong um, and they broadcast a fraud proof, that that fraud proof actually will reach and to make it onto the blockchain. So there is this assumption that basically the network is working and in a lot of cases that the network is working sufficiently quickly. And if this assumption is violated, then the fraud proof scheme stops working, right? Like it's, um, you know, the equivalent of, um, well, you know, if you um, att attest to some statement in, in a court and then the court makes a bunch of decisions based on that statement. And then, you know, 20 years later, they discover that you just lied and everything, but by that time you're already dead. It's um, so... The uh, equivalent of uh, that in uh, blockchain land uh, like basically is uh, kind of what would happen if uh, you know, there's uh, some a large network failure or the chain uh, got uh, got censored by 51% attack or something similar. And so basically, if you can avoid those uh, kinds of assumptions, you should, right? And the interesting thing with sharding is that I feel like we actually have been really reducing the number of assumptions that we rely on over time. Uh, so, for example, before, sharding relied on honest majority assumptions. Now it doesn't rely uh, nearly as much on uh, honest majority assumptions. So you can't uh, get an invalid sharded block past someone, even if you control two-thirds of the validators. And so there's been a lot of hard work that's been done on kind of reducing these new assumptions that these uh, scaling techniques introduce. Um, but you know, there are still some assumptions uh, that end up remaining. Uh, fraud proofs, by the way, um, if we use ZK rollups, then we can get rid of the need for any fraud proofs. We can have sharding without fraud proofs, which is just amazing. It's something we did not even think was possible two years ago. Um, so and there's like basically there definitely are some uh, kind of intellectual critics that do kind of get into the weeds of each of these things. And they say, oh, well, you know, decentralization is really, really, really important. And is um, even a 100x gain in scalability worth it if the price of that gain in scalability is that you introduce this uh, completely new category of unknown unknown that would otherwise uh, not exist? Uh, so I think like there is some legitimate critique, but like over time we have, I think, been addressing more, uh, more and more of it. And so we have been more and more confident that sharding is a, a good trade-off. So Vitalik, you recently uh, posted something on E3 Search, a, a, a kind of a, a thought piece called Rollup Centric Roadmap with a question mark. Mm -hmm. And that provoked another soundbite that was sort of interesting. People asking, is sharding canceled, Vitalik? And I, you know, I, I'm interested in your, your answer on that. I think it's probably going to be no. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess a, a follow-up question on that is, how are rollups actually different than shards? So the answer, of course, is no. Um, but um, I mean, I can answer why the answer is no. 
Uh, so, I, so first of all, uh, sharding is not canceled. And the reason why sharding is not canceled is that phase one, which provides sharding of data, is not canceled. And phase one is sharding, right? Because phase one is a mechanism where each participant in the network only needs to download and verify a small portion of the data, which is uh, the definition of sharding. Um, and then from a user experience and like what people actually get perspective, sharding is also not canceled because the concept of Ethereum's TPS going up from 15 to many thousands is not canceled. And in fact, it's going to come even sooner than people thought it would. So mm -hmm. sharding is coming and sharding is uh, coming sooner as a result of these uh, refocusings, uh, in my opinion. Um, what was the other question again? How rollups are actually different than shards? Yes, yes. This is a, a definitely good uh, question. Uh, so, and it's an interesting question, right? Because uh, like a lot of the time people get hung up on and confused about the word sharding because they think of a shard as being a cluster of nodes, but that's never how we thought of sharding, right? The way that we've thought of sharding is that a shard is a, a kind of logical subset of the blockchain and nodes get assigned to shards. And the node could be part of one shard, it could be part of two shards, or it could be part of all the shards. Uh, and so in the case of a rollup, what happens is that it's uh, it has some of the properties of sharding, but not all of the properties of sharding, right? So one of the properties of sharding that it has is this uh, property that computation gets split apart, right? That um, if you have many different rollups, then computation in each of these uh, rollups is uh, done separately by separate uh, kind of subsets of uh, participants. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the key thing that's uh, responsible for uh, getting them a scalability. Um, so that's um, one uh, place in which rollups are kind of like sharding. Another place where rollups are like sharding, I think you guys actually talked about this in uh, one of your previous episodes. I think it was either with Haydn or someone or, or a paradigm person or someone else um, talking about uh, kind of the future of Uniswap and market makers in a sharded context. Um, where you know, you're talking about kind of, you know, the if core Ethereum chain is being like Manhattan, then you have your suburbs. Um, and rollups and shards actually from that economic standpoint to have a, a very a similar functionality uh, because uh, they are both, uh, the new terminology that we use is a domains, right? And what a domain is, it's a, a kind of collection of accounts or kind of a region of state where you can have synchronous interaction between accounts within that region, but you can only have asynchronous interaction uh, between that region and other regions, right? So like, what I mean by synchronous interaction is like, for example, uh, being able to, um, you know, take out a, uh, a, um, a CDP from uh, like Maker or Compound, then uh, use some coins, uh, stick them into Uniswap, then do some arbitrage trade, then take the output, then stick that into Aave, and then do some other thing and just do a bunch of fancy stuff within one transaction um, and then get the results. And if like something breaks, then you just immediately revert everything, right? Like for that kind of fancy magic to be possible, you need to be within the same domain. You need to be within the same environment where what we call synchronous execution is possible. Um, asynchronous execution is like, I send a transaction and that transaction gets in over here and it's going to have an effect over there, but that effect is delayed. Like for example, I send some ETH from shard A to shard B, I, I lose the ETH immediately, but you get the ETH in shard uh, B like one slot later or two slots later. Um, and uh, synchronous execution is possible within shards, synchronous execution is possible within rollups, but only asynchronous execution is possible between shards. and only asynchronous execution is easy to implement between rollups. It's you have more leeway to potentially design rollups, so you can sometimes do synchronous execution between them, but uh, it, it's it's still a challenge, right? So that's another way in which shards and rollups are similar. Um, one way in which shards and rollups are different is the security model, right? So. In the case of just uh, using rollups, rollups all rely on the same data layer, and uh, that data layer gets uh, at least uh, by you know in the current ETH one system downloaded by everyone, and uh, verified by everyone. So there is still something which is being verified by everyone, and that something allows you to avoid some of the uh, trade offs that are inherent in a yeah, sh sharded system. Um, so that's. Um, so that's one example of an area where shards and uh, rollups are different. So I guess uh, just uh, kind of summarizing again, like there are some similarities, there are some differences. To the end user, shards and rollups definitely feel very similar. 
Um, another really fun thing uh, going down the road is that when we have ETH2 and rollups um, at the same time, and you have the rollups on top of ETH2, then you know different rollups might end up using different shards. You could have one rollup that uses five shards. Uh, you could have five rollups that are sharing the same shard. Um, so in that case, uh, kind of shards become this technical um, distinction that, that's just about kind of grouping data into blobs, and rollups are the more relevant uh, kind of distinction in terms of like domains that's some. Uh, that's more relevant uh, to the experiences of uh, individual users. So keeping on this roll-up centric roadmap uh, post, I, re I read the post and uh, I, I thought it was fantastic, like um, very, very exciting, I would say. But could you describe like kind of what that post actually means about the, the role of um, <laughs> the role of roll-ups in an ETH2 world? And w what are the wins for the ETH community in a roll-up centric mm -hmm. roadmap? Um, so I think uh, and just this is a good opportunity to kind of cycle back a bit into the conversation on Ethereum values. Uh, and I think, you know, I talked a lot about how Ethereum values and Bitcoin values have uh, similarities. Um, one uh, place where there might be more difference, uh, at least, you know, I feel and then, I mean, I'm sure people will accuse me of bias for this and so on and so forth. But you know, the Ethereum community really values uh, pragmatism um, and uh, just valuing you know, making decisions that make sense um, given just the context that's uh, kind of standing right in front of us and what uh, people and application developers need. Uh, and like this has played out in a couple of ways. Like one way, for example, is that Ethereum miners actually have been willing to raise the gas limits somewhat. Uh, and so instead of the burden of uh, increased demand for usage falling entirely on users uh, facing higher transaction fees, some of the burden falls on users paying trans higher transaction fees. Some of the burden falls on users having higher validation costs. And so, you know, on net, it's probably a, a, a better trade-off uh, than if we had just uh, kind of stuck gung-ho to keeping one uh, block size um, but in this context, uh, basically, the post had uh, kind of two main themes to it. Well, the first main theme is just, you know, hey, look at reality. And uh, what I mean by that is if you look at the current reality of, uh, you know, where Ethereum is, what kind of scaling is needed, and uh, what kind of scaling is there, like we see a few facts in front of us, right? One fact is that there's a dire need for scalability to increase, and there's a dire need for this to happen quickly. Gas prices over the last couple of months have hit all the way up to 700 GUE on uh, a couple of occasions. Now they're a bit lower, but they're still, uh, you know, hovering around um, in the in the tens, uh, going up to 100 uh, from uh, time to time. Uh, so gas prices are still, by historically standards, astronomically high, and they're high enough to um, kick out uh, many classes of applications that in, in many cases represent uh, what we think uh, Ethereum is there to accomplish, and especially uh, on the uh, non-financial side. And so scaling is very uh, important. Uh, so that's the one fact. Scaling is important. Scaling is urgent. The second fact is that the technology that is available today um, in, or in the realistic near term to alleviate scaling is rollups, right? Rollups are the game. Now, there are channels, but channels are very application specific. Uh, there is Plasma. Plasma works for payments, but it doesn't work well for general purpose contracts. And so rollups are just the centerpiece of the game. And so we need to be serious about the fact that if we want medium term scalability, people are going to be moving to rollups. And like this isn't even a suggestion. This is just a uh, recognition of the of reality that's facing us. Um, and then the second uh, really interesting thing is that if you look at the uh, combination of uh, rollups with just the uh, way that the uh, ETH2 roadmap is rolling out, right, the ETH2 roadmap is rolling out in these multiple phases where phase zero is proof of stake, phase one is sharding of uh, data, and phase two is sharding of execution. And it turns out that phase one, sharding of data, is actually the only thing that you need to put rollups on top of sharding and give us just really, really massive scalability. And so it turns out that if we're willing to uh, kind of move over onto rollups, then not only will we get the scalability we direly need uh, today, but we will also just get extremely huge scalability beyond our wildest dreams as soon as uh, phase one. And so given these facts, um, there is both the, kind of once again, recognition of reality that rollups are the game for the uh, medium term future, but also the, there is the proposal 
that the Ethereum ecosystem should basically just dedicate itself to rollups as a, a strategy, uh, and that the Ethereum ecosystem should not try to have its own uh, base layer execution and should just like, rely on rollups as being its main mechanism for scaling applications. And I give two reasons for this. One of them is that rollups are going to be here sooner and they'll have higher scalability. So why sacrifice the higher scalability thing for the lower scalability thing? And the second reason that I give is uh, that uh, roll, uh, if we have a, a base chain that is more kind of retrenched and more focused, then we can reduce the number of uh, sec new security assumptions that we have, right? And in particular, we can avoid committee and fraud proof assumptions. Uh, and this would significantly increase the security of the ETH2 chain, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, and uh, it would allow the kind of roll-up ecosystem to basically just kind of do its own thing. Um, and then the third, uh, kind of, once again, uh, kind of pragmatic uh, part of this uh, roadmap is basically the fact that you know, there is this uh, kind of Ethereum satellite ecosystem of, uh, as uh, Matt Feinstone recently said in his great post, uh, kind of, I think it was Ethereum helpers or Ethereum enablers, and even Ethereum killers who are respecting to being Ethereum enablers, uh, which is just awesome. Um, and so basically, if we adopt this, this uh, roll-up focused roadmap, then instead of uh, ETH2 uh, kind of positioning itself to squash these projects, ETH2 would be positioning itself to cooperate with these projects and to uh, kind of be a platform where those projects can end up helping to just be its uh, execution scaling layer on top, which uh, creates a lot of synergy. It also creates a lot of room for these projects to kind of do more experiments, um, also potentially do more public goods funding for the Ethereum ecosystem and do a lot of other um, wonderful things that would not be possible for Ethereum to do by itself. Brian started off this conversation asking the question, you know, how are shards and rollups really all that different, right? And, you know, part, part of the answer is that rollups represent sort of this, um, you, you just said satellite, kind of like the satellite away from the main chain that has like a direct one-to-one -one bridge with the main chain. And I think what you just alluded to is that that same relationship can also happen with the, the quote-unquote ETH killers, right? Turning them into mm -hmm. ETH, ETH enablers, Ethereum enablers. Mm -hmm. And so to me, and at the same time, we've also seen almost every single Ethereum app announce some sort of L2 system, some sort of rollup that they are going to leverage, right? Um, and and th this happens, you know, every single day. There's like a news like, oh, we're hopping on to an L2. And so when so many different systems, applications on Ethereum or, you know, side chains or Ethereum killers are able to... Uh, link into Ethereum directly via a rollup, via some sort of L2 system, how does that change the character characterization of the L1, right? Because that, that turns it into a place where everyone seems to be transacting, you know, sending tokens, buying, selling on Uniswap. You know, the people are all living on L1, and it seems to be pushing them into living on L2s. So how, do, how does this change how we are going to have our, our relationship with the L1 of Ethereum? So it definitely will be the case that a user's primary base is going to be generally an L2 system, right? So like I think in the long run, there may well be even be users that just go years uh, using Ethereum without ever touching L1, without ever setting up an account inside of an L1. Um, the main reason why um, a user might want to use an L1, one is uh, as part of moving between one L2 and another, though even there you can uh, save a lot on transaction fees by creating kind of optimized mass exit mechanisms. Uh, and uh, two would be if some kind of L2 potentially breaks. Um, and three would be that there are some applications where it might make sense to have a kind of the core of the application be registered on the base chain and then have that application um, kind of have satellites of itself, so to speak, exist on the L2 side, right? So one example of this might be a token. And so if you issue a token, I, like, I'm predicting that the main way to issue a token is still going to be to have the base registry be on the Ethereum base chain directly. And, but then, you know, users and uh, kind of intermediaries will just end up depositing that token into uh, the L2 systems. And then you'll have a lot of people just doing things with uh, that token directly on the L2 side. So I definitely think that those, uh, those kinds of things are going to happen a lot. And there's definitely going to be some kind of level of people figuring out, well, exactly what is that going to look like? You know, for any given application, do they want their application to live on a particular rollup? Do they want it to be cross-roll-up cross and so on? Um, 
And that's one of those things that we're just going to have to figure out over the next uh, kind of few months or a year, a year or two. Um, but I'm confident uh, that we'll be able to. Like, I, this is going to be a slow transition. We're going to see more and more applications start to migrate to L layer twos over time. Users are going to migrate more and more of their activity to uh, layer twos over time. And I, I, I think we'll get through it. I think we'll be fine. Earlier in this podcast, you discussed how scalability is important because without scalability, you allow for the entrance of middlemen, right? And mm -hmm. and what Ryan and I have been discussing with with Bankless is that, you know, it, we like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's fantastic. Uh, but we are concerned that it is going to be a system that is basically gated through Bitcoin banks, right? Because you know, if uh, Bitcoin gets adopted uh, completely and holistically, then there's not enough scale on, a th on Bitcoin for every single individual to be able to transact on the L1. And therefore, you know, people get pushed into like, hey, I'll send you Bitcoin through Coinbase and Coinbase just settles with their own internal ledger rather than mm -hmm. it being on the, like, the trustless, permissionless, open Bitcoin blockchain. It, it seems to be that, uh, that roll-ups and L2s like them offer you know, Ethereum-level capabilities of, of scale and execution environments and trustlessness that is exactly what you were talking about with like, well, with increased scale, we don't have to rely on centralized ledgers. We can use roll-up ledgers. And so is it, the conversation around roll-ups and reducing intermediaries, is, is that kind of what you were, were referring to at the beginning of this podcast? Uh, yeah, I and mean, I think um, like basically either people are going to be on a decentralized layer two or people are going to be on a, cent on a centralized layer two. Uh, I mean, Coinbase is obviously one of the more blatant examples of a centralized layer two, but there's also more subtle examples like, uh, you know, there's permissioned consortium chains um, like, you know, we're seeing Liquid, for example. Um, and even in uh, the Ethereum case, and there's definitely some applications that are moving to, you know, either something like XDAI, um, or in the case of, uh, the, the Dark Forest game on, uh, I think it was either the, uh, Robston or Gurley or one of those, uh, test nets. And it's completely understandable why that's happening because, uh, just the scalability for a uh, kind of properly Ethereum connected system is not there yet. Um, but it, um... Uh, it is something where we want to make the kind of properly decentralized and trustless alternative actually available. So what about the possibility? One of the things that everyone's concerned about with, you know, the, the sharding and also with rollups is composability. Because with mm -hmm. uh, DeFi currently, composability is kind of like our big thing, right? Like you, you mentioned a possible transaction where, you know, there's a flash loan from Aave that's trading on Uniswap and DYDX and does everything at once, right? And, you know, sh mm -hmm. sharding gets in the way of that. But then also rollups also gets in the way of that as well. Um, so I was hoping you could kind of just go through some of the strategies for uh, key, uh, retaining composability. And then also, mm -hmm. is there a possible way for, you know, each individual rollup to have, you know, a direct connection with each other that doesn't leverage the L1? Sure. Um, so uh, I guess... Uh... First of all, I mean, there are some kind of application-specific strategies that can uh, get you m many, maybe most of the benefits of uh, NFT composability, even in an asynchronous context. Uh, so one thing that I talk about, for example, is uh, the concept of yanking. Um, so the uh, kind of big example problem that I often use to talk about kind of synchronous composability is, uh, and uh, I, uh, I credit Andrew Miller for this, and I think Andrew Miller himself credits uh, basically mainstream distributed systems textbooks, is the uh, train and hotel problem. And the train and hotel problem basically says, if you have a train on chart A, um, or if, sorry, if you have a train ticket booking contract on chart A and the hotel booking contract on chart B, then how do you um, book the train and the hotel in such a way that you ensure that you're booking uh, either both the train and the hotel or neither, right? Because you don't want to have the train without the hotel um, and you don't want to have the hotel without the train. And if the train contract and the hotel contract are on the same shard, this is easy because uh, you just uh, send a transaction which does like step one, book the train, step two, book the hotel. And if either of those fails, you revert and reverting cancels both. In an asynchronous context, this is much harder, right? Um, and what you can do, though, is this mechanism called yanking. So the way yanking works is uh, you design the train booking and hotel booking contract in such a way that you 
represent the permission to book a particular seat um, as a kind of separate discrete contract, right? So then step one, uh, you call the train booking contract on short A, and you basically create this uh, kind of separate contract that represents the right to, bo to book a particular seat. Uh, step two, uh, you do the same on the hotel side. Step three, you take the train uh, seat booking contract and the hotel booking seat contract, and you move them both to uh, whatever shard you're on. Right. Then step four. Now that you're both of those are on the same shard, uh, you are just you do your synchronous transaction and you book both the train and the hotel. And if either one fails, then you uh, uh, are kind of revert both. Now the reason why this approach works is because it is definitely possible that you know because of asynchrony, blah blah, something happens on one side but not on the other side. The train gets booked or the hotel gets booked, but. Until um, you uh, um, do that final step where you already have both of those uh, contracts on the same shard, you actually haven't booked anything, right? So if uh, you know you do this kind of separation and then someone else uh, snaps up the train or someone else snaps up the hotel, uh, then you know, that's fine. You will board um, and uh, you just basically wait some time and you try again. Uh, so it's or alternatively, if you bring the train and the hotel into your shard, but then you go offline, then there might be a timeout, and then someone else can go bo uh, book the train in the hotel, right? So you still have this uh, kind of safety property um, because you're basically kind of doing a asynchronous pre-processing step where you kind of drag the permission to do whatever thing you want to do onto the same shard, and then only at the final step do you do everything on um, uh, all of the kind of final commit steps at the same time on that one shard. And you might ask, well, why do we care about trains and hotels? But it turns out that this is a, a kind of excellent technical metaphor for a very wide class of, you know, decentralized exchange and like other DeFi things that people actually care about doing. So sometimes you can do um, things like that. Um, and if you can, then uh, this is wonderful. Now, if you can't, um, there is another alternative that rollups want us to do. And that alternative is basically that, you know, we just accept that some rollups are going to be more focused on high value applications and DeFi and they'll have higher gas prices and other rollups or, uh, uh, are going to be focused on um, applications that have lower fees, but that do not have synchronous connection to the high value stuff. Um, and um, the other fun thing that we can do is like, especially post sharding, um, you can have a single rollup that uh, talks to multiple shards, right? So you can have a single rollup that uses uh, the data from multiple shards. And so you can potentially have a rollup that has scalability that combines together multiple shards, which is potentially um, really amazing. And if you do that, then you could imagine this uh, kind of DeFi focused rollup as having a scalability of you know, like many thousands of uh, transactions per second, in which case it could just easily be enough for uh, the kind of bulk of the important uh, high value activity to happen on there. So yeah, and I guess in summary, you know, there's a, a kind of combination of these uh, different approaches and uh, kind of, you know, I think uh, any one of them can uh, work well. And uh, I think the market will kind of gravitate toward the thing that makes sense. So Vitalik, to wrap up this roll-up roll centric roadmap uh, section, like I guess some of the takeaways, the wins for the Ethereum community is, you know, A, you said it's pragmatic. This is happening now. Um, two, it seems like speed, right? So th this can happen as soon as ETH phase, ETH2 phase one, uh, which is maybe a year away. Uh, my timeline, not yours. That's an estimate. <laughs> um, the, the last thing I guess I'm, phasey, I'm, I'm a bit hazy on though, in this roll-up centric roadmap view, uh, what changes in ETH2 phase two? So do we even need state execution across these these 64 shards? We have sharding in this data availability layer and we're scaling with rollups. Um, mm -hmm. Does ETH2 phase two get a lot more simple? Right. Uh, so in the extreme version of the roadmap, you just don't need ETH2 phase two at all. Right? You just say phase one and then the merge and then um, you know for the base chain, that's the end of history. Like you can do some incremental upgrades, like upgrade to uh, Casper CBC, maybe do some zero knowledge proof stuff, but you don't need to fundamentally change it again. That's the extreme version of the roadmap. The somewhat less extreme version says, you know, well, maybe things are going to be safer and more convenient if uh, base chain gas prices are still somewhat more affordable. And if that's true, then, you know, maybe instead of one execution shard, maybe we can have like four or eight execution shards. So it's still theoretically possible for one user to run all the execution shards if they have to, but it's a little bit harder. Uh, so that is an uh, intermediate path that we could potentially take. Another p intermediate path that we could take is um, 
having phase two come much later when uh, we have uh, the ability to just use ZK Snarks to zero knowledge proof the EVM, uh, at which point we actually will be able to just do a kind of base chain execution without relying on any fraud proof assumptions. Um, so there's different versions of phase two that become possible and we don't have to commit to any specific one of them for quite some time. So we preserve the optionality, right? But the nice thing about this is like the, the haziest part of the ETH2 roadmap and, you know, like kind of design is um, ETH2 phase two, really. Mm -hmm. um, so if you kind of don't need that in order to scale with rollups, then scalability on Ethereum happens a whole lot faster. Yes. Exactly. And if two phase two is definitely not necessary for um, users to get scalability. I mean, that's never been true. Like, it's, I think it's the, the fact that you could do a sharding plus a roll ups to get really high scalability has been true um, as a, a property of the roadmap for a long time. But I guess it's only been in the last couple of weeks that people have like properly realized that it's true. Vitalik, I want to turn the conversation to EIP-1559. And for EIP-1559, like its utility or, or its beauty is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, you know, for some, for some people, it changes mm -hmm. the monetary policy of Ethereum, and that's its greatest feature. For others, it uh, makes transacting on Ethereum much more easy. It's just a better mm -hmm. experience because they don't users don't have to worry about gas. There's also the conversation of uh, minor extractable value and how EIP-1559 can help mitigate the instability that minor extractable value can, can cause. So when you think of EIP-1559, what, what do you see? Honestly, I see all of those things. Like uh, EIP-1559 was definitely originally created as a fee market improvement uh, proposal that basically said, well, instead of having this really horrible fee market that we have today, where users have to send transactions either with really high fees or they have to wait a uh, random and uh, unknowable, unknowable amount of time for no reason, um, we'll have this market where we have uh, kind of less volatility on the fee side and admit a little bit more volatility on the block size side. Um, and uh, this ends up again, just being much safer for the network. Uh, so that was uh, one motivation. Um, and at the same time, you know, like I, you know, I wrote this big long paper um, uh, uh, where I talk about these uh, out of different uh, benefits. Another one is like getting rid of the inefficiencies of a first price auction, um, and then you know, the list uh, kind of goes longer and longer. I mean, another one is uh, getting rid of uh, some uh, safety issues of a uh, uh, of a fee dominant blockchain. So there's a lot of problems that uh, fee market uh, reform ends up uh, solving. And then the other side of all this, of course, is, you know, the burn. Um, and the burn um, is, of course, uh, this uh, thing that uh, a lot more people uh, end up focusing on, right? And like there definitely is this uh, kind of dynamic where you have some people that are interested in uh, fee market reform for the more technocratic reasons, some people that are interested in fee market reform for the more kind of, quote, populist reasons, and then um, there's uh, people who see the value of both, which is uh, a camp that I would definitely put myself in. Uh, and like, I think that is um, probably the big, one of the bigger reasons why it's uh, so powerful, right? Like it does just somehow kind of hit the jackpot in terms of having this uh, fairly large set of uh, benefits uh, for Ethereum all at the same time. One of the things I really like about EIP-1559 is how it, well, in my opinion, it adds to the credible neutrality of Ether, the asset, right? And especially yes. its relationship to Ethereum as the way that Ethereum comes to be validated in proof of stake. We were talking mm -hmm. earlier about, you know, Ether distribution and kind of the, the question of who should get Ether issuance um, in the, in how Ethereum becomes validated. Right. And, you know, while we just, just uh, decided that, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that proof of stake is not a distribution mechanism, but that also comes with the benefit of, you know, proof of stake being really, really secure. Uh, and instead of ether being a distribution mechanism, I think EIP 1559 reduces the political nature of ether issuance by socializing ether burn ether because instead of having the transaction fees sent to the stakers who you know could be a quote unquote privileged party those transaction fees are sent to all ether holders everywhere do, do you see this mm -hmm. as a uh, a depoliticizing or credible neutrality uh, boosting force for the monetary policy of, of ether uh yeah uh, so i think um 
One uh, kind of important thing about uh, the uh, EAP 1559 and uh, particularly the fee burning property is that it just establishes the centrality of uh, ETH uh, within the uh, kind of Ethereum economic ecosystem. Uh, so what I mean by this is that if you don't have this, and then in some ways uh, Ether becomes uh, kind of the most anti-privileged asset on the network. And what I mean by this is that like, Ultimately, you know, you can do things with ETH or you can do things with other assets. And especially if we have rollups, uh, then you, know, you could even imagine a rollup where the uh, sequencer pays uh, transaction fees with ETH, uh, but then all the users pay the fees to, uh, their fees to the sequencer in like DAI or whatever else. And eventually the uh, rollup uh, sequencer could just have private agreements with mining pools and they could just uh, use PayPal or um, avoid ETH entirely. Uh, and so the problem that you get is that ETH doesn't really uh, kind of have special privileges in the Ethereum network, but it does have a special burden. And the special burden is that it's ETH and only ETH that has to suffer the expense of uh, more of it being printed um, in order to secure the yeah, network, right? Uh, and uh, the uh, transaction fee burn basically fixes this problem because ETH does have this unique burn, but it also has the unique benefit that it is this asset that is uh, kind of ultimately indispensable if you want to uh, pay fees on the uh, or get transactions included on the Ethereum network. Right? Even if a user ends up paying and die, there's like some intermediary that's going to have to uh, get some ETH and actually burn the ETH in order to uh, get the transaction included. Um, and so that actually does, I think, uh, kind of bring the uh, economics of the Ethereum ecosystem uh, somewhat more in, uh, in balance. And the last variable that's related here is minor extractable value. And the minor extractable value is, uh, in, in a summary, mm -hmm. the value that a miner or also a validator can extract as their privileged role of being able to order transactions, right? And and also be a, being able to insert their transactions in that order as they see fit, that allows them to extract value. And a way to you know, kind of quantify minor extractable value is to look at the fees being paid to Ethereum in any particular block. And during the yield farming mania, we saw, you know, Ether blocks having, you know, you know, three, four, five, eight Ether as reward for fees on top of that 12. Oh, mm. yeah, 12. That's, that's crazy. On top of just the two Ether that's issued every single block. Now, mm -hmm. with VIP 1559, it's an elegant solution because a lot of that fee, uh, a lot of those fees would just get burned. And that yeah. is, that's, that's cr the credible neutrality that we were talking about. But the combination of minor extractable value and EIP 1559 means that we're going to be burning a, a lot of ETH proportionally. Does this change the relationship between Ether and Ethereum in any meaningful way? I mean, as I think I just uh, kind of mentioned, it does uh, kind of reinforce this, the uh, centrality of um, ETH, um, just, uh, you know, because there just is a lot of ETH that's going to have to like really properly go out of circulation um, every time uh, one of these uh, transaction fee spikes ends up happening. Uh, in terms of minor extractable value, I mean, I think... Uh, one of the challenges is that there's uh, different kinds of minor extractable value. Like fees are obviously one kind of uh, MEV, and that's important. And uh, with the EAP1559, the fees are going to be largely captured by the protocol. Um, another kind of MEV, though, is like arbitrage, right? Like if you have the kind of right of uh, first refusal to push transactions into a block, then if the price of like any token moves, you can be the first to claim all of the Uniswap arbitrage, uh, for example, right? And that's another privilege that miners have. And it's a privilege that currently miners are not very good at claiming. But in a roll-up centric roadmap, that privilege is going to be largely claimed by uh, basically roll-up sequencers and roll-up projects themselves, um, which is um, actually a really interesting equilibrium. And I actually like this because it basically means that, you know, not all the value is going to get captured to pay for security. There's some value that could potentially be captured and uh, directed to pay for other public goods like uh, no, I, I definitely, you know, can encourage you to like talk to Jing from uh, the yeah, Optimism team at some point. Um, um, in terms of uh, kind of some of her thoughts on uh, using uh, minor extractable value to pay for um, other kinds of uh, just Ethereum uh, uh, level and uh, potentially even wider uh, public goods. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot there that can be explored as well. Um, but 
Yeah, and I think the Ethereum ecosystem is going to get uh, kind of better and better at sort of plugging the loop and uh, basically um, ensuring that you know any opportunity to capture value becomes uh, kind of directly linked to uh, opportunities to deploy that value for productively for the good of the whole ecosystem. We do have a podcast with Carl and, and Jing Lan from Optimism slated sometime into the future, so that absolutely will be discussed. Yay. So Vitalik, let's let's talk about this kind of I guess last piece of um, Ethereum 2.0, and we we've spent the the entirety of the conversation kind of going through all of the pieces and and the values and the decisions as to to why, and I guess ignoring ETH2 phase two, right? There is this notion with kind of roll ups that we brought up where if we get to Ethereum uh, two phase you know one point five where we're mm-hmm. actually merging ETH1 and ETH2 together, um, that gets us a lot of what we need for scalability. So I want to talk mm-hmm. about that. And like w- one thing that strikes me is, um, you know, the, the whole concept of ETH2 as sort of a separate network is almost a, a misnomer, or at least it's, it's temporary. Um, I think you've called like ETH2 previous to, to all of this, previous before it got memed into ETH2, Serenity as sort of the, the next launch. And that's when we really start to see that this is this has always been one cohesive roadmap when ETH1 yes. and ETH2 phase together, together. So ignoring like ETH2 phase two, how will the transition work when we merge these chains together? Uh, so just to kind of repeating the roadmap, right? So first we have phase zero, which is coming very soon when uh, the uh, proof of stake part is going to start. Then phase one, where that, uh, the new new proof of stake beacon chain gets extended with data shards. Then um, we have the merge. Um, and uh, this is the critical part, right? What happens in the merge is basically that we take the existing Ethereum state, uh, so the accounts, balances, smart contracts, code, smart contract storage, all of that stuff, and we kind of just cut and paste it in t- from the ETH1 system into the ETH2 system. And then from then on, if you have an Ethereum client, it will stop looking at the ETH1 chain and it will start looking at the ETH2 chain. So the kind of the place where you would need to put transactions if you want to interact with those applications after that point on will be in the ETH2 chain. And it will be the ETH2 chain that processes the uh, transactions uh, kind of executes the state transitions and that does all, um, all of those things, right? So like basically kind of the core um, engine, the, well, I shouldn't say the engine. The engine is more like the proof of work and the proof of stake. The core kind of thing that is being maintained is going to be uh, sort of transplanted from the ETH1 system directly into the ETH2 system. It's the uh, engine um, that will, like, kind of before it was a proof of work, but uh, kind of after the transplant, it will be living as a part of the uh, proof of stake system that will have been already running for um, like, over a year by that time. So if you're a user, you don't really need to worry too much. The transition will happen uh, largely um, automatically, and you don't need to do anything special to you know, move your coins over or move your contracts over. Like everything just uh, moves over by default. Um, and then if you're a client developer, then you know, the transition is, like, you can think of it as just being like a special type of hard fork, basically. And at that point, the ETH1 chain will effectively be no longer useful. It will die? Correct. What EIP features do we need in ETH1 before it freezes? EIP 1559, is there anything else? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, theoretically, the roadmap would work um, if we uh, change nothing about ETH1 between now and the merge. But there are things that would be good to uh, to include, right? So I mean, EIP fifteen fifty nine, them um, certainly. Uh, I mean, ETH two has its own uh, kind of built in form of uh, EIP fifteen fifty nine. Um, but then uh, the ETH two version focuses on like bytes because ETH two is just a, a data environment. But you know, for, we wanted to have it for gas as well. Uh, and another and nice thing to have would be stateless execution. Um, so uh, the ability to kind of execute blocks without having the full state. Um, and this is something that ETH1 is slowly moving towards. Like there's uh, an EIP to, to change to a binary tree. There is uh, an uh, EIP to uh, increase the gas cost of some operations that have a really heavy uh, witness cost um, and so on and so forth. Um, so... There's definitely things that would be really nice to get included in ETH1 before then. And then obviously just generally efficiency improvements. Um, but 
like a really a lot of things and even the important things like theoretically it could happen before or after the switch Vitalik, we want to thank you for giving us your time. This has been a very insightful, very helpful podcast to go through why we are doing what we are doing here in the Ethereum world. And we want to we want to finish up with a roll up round if, if you are game. Mm -hmm. All right. So first first roll up question. Phase zero, 2020 or 2021? I think 2020. Next question. ZK roll ups or optimistic roll ups? Who do you love more? Mm, uh, short term optimistic, uh, long term, I expect uh, kind of ZK to inch into a better and better position over time as uh, ZK roll ups become better at doing more general purpose things. Vitalik, what does Moloch mean to you? Uh, Moloch is the uh, rationalist god of uh, coordination failure. It's uh, kind of the representation of uh, all that is wrong with the world uh, that can possibly not be wrong if we could uh, just uh, learn to find ways to cooperate better. And uh, slaying Moloch is uh, one of the major things that I think the Ethereum ecosystem can be about. China versus the United States in the current digital currency race. Who wins? Mm, um I mean, I guess uh, China definitely seems uh, kind of more on top of the game in terms of uh, kind of D just getting DCEP um, out there. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, in the long term, uh, and I don't think the the interesting question is like government A versus government B so much as it is like, you know, the category of uh, kind of governments doing uh, their CBDC is in that particular way versus uh, uh, kind of alternative approaches. Um, like, I mean, like, first question, you know, like, is DCP even going to succeed at like beating out existing uh, kind of centralized uh, fiats like uh, WeChat Pay, which is already very convenient? Um, and then uh, second question is like, in other places, um, you know, what advantages are CBDC is going to end up having relative to other forms of digital payments? And then finally, um, you know, like, are they going to be the primary way that people end up uh, actually doing international commerce or do a fully decentralized uh, currencies stand a chance of uh, kind of capturing um, a lot of uh, market share there, either directly or as a kind of glue layer between these uh, nationalist systems. I think uh, seeing um, just what, where the equilibrium lands there, just like in terms of, you know, the category of uh, kind of nation states doing things directly versus nation states uh, kind of interacting with the commercial banking sector versus just crypto as a yeah, separate glue layer or potentially um, nation states coming up with CBDC is so that uh, can like in, interact with uh, the crypto layer more closely that and I don't know we'll see there is at the time of recording 142,000 BTC tokenized in various different ways on the ethereum network how would you describe the long-term relationship between Bitcoin and ethereum Mm. Uh, and I definitely expect Raps Bitcoin on the Ethereum side to grow over time. My main concern that I've uh, raised multiple times and I keep raising is the trust model. Like a lot of these Raps BDCs, they uh, kind of hide what their trust model is or they don't talk about it openly or they talk about what their trust model is going to be in five years, but not what it is today. Uh, and they often end up being fairly centralized in practice. And this really worries me. I want to see more decentralized uh wrapper tokens uh, that have at the very least a multi-sig trust model um, and then see if we can do even better than that does tbtc from the keep project fit into that category it's definitely one of the more interesting trust models um though i mean one challenge is that the kind of collateral costs of um having uh, eth be there to back the btc are significant uh, and so it will it, like, it will be forced to charge like some kind of um, interest charge i think on the on, on deposits at some point um but which uh, some the more centralized ones are likely not going to be able to uh, or not going to have to do but i don't know we'll see vitalik say phase zero ships in 2020 as you predict do you think that regular people regular eth holders should start staking at the eth2 launch or should they wait some time uh, I think like, if you're an intrepid enthusiast, you should stake at the beginning. Um, if not, then you should uh, wait some time. And I think that's okay. Like I, we actually want to have a uh, relatively smaller number of people staking at the beginning and uh, kind of increase that over time as uh, people get more comfortable. Vitalik, it has been a pleasure to have you on Bankless. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts on why ETH2 and the value set that drives this very important project in the crypto, in the crypto ecosystem. No, thank you. This has been great.
All right, guys, action items. Uh, Vitalik included a bunch of articles that he referenced in this conversation. We will include those articles, including Slasher, a punitive proof of stake algorithm, and his philosophy in the show notes. So you can click on those and read up on that material. Also, we've included Vitalik's post on ETH research on the rollup centric roadmap. That is fantastic reading if you're trying to get familiar with how the ETH2 roadmap is shaping up. Um, lastly, we have a guide on ETH2 staking. We're going to be putting more guides on ETH2 staking as it uh, as it becomes available. I think we're close now. So we've included a, a link to that guide and you can check it out there. Risks and disclaimers. Of course, crypto is risky. So is ETH. This is not financial advice. DeFi is risky. You could lose what you put in. So be careful out there. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone. But thanks for joining us.